All right, hello everyone. Thanks for joining. It's June 1st. This is John Jay. I'm going to talk about some interesting topics tonight. Um, some of them we've already discussed, but I'm going to introduce something new. But before I do, I just want to review a few of the things. <clears throat> so you see here, I guess my screen sharing. Let me go back to that real quick. Just want to go over the topics. I use as a guide. Now I came up with these things because over the last couple of years, actually since 2020, um, I started putting these things together. And uh, what I found is that they're even more effective than I thought. So <clears throat> to start with, this security agreement on the biometric data is going to be essential to defeating things like the central uh, central bank digital currency and even the TSA and, and things of this nature. Even if you've given up your uh, your biometric data, you can actually reclaim the ownership and the property rights of it. And you can actually make it a liability for those who would collect it, store it, and use it. This is what we're trying to do. We're not trying to create a situation where we're going to sue people. <clears throat> we just want to create a situation where it's going to create a liability to collect our data. And I don't know what that looks like, except possibly they'll stop doing it. I don't know. Um, and it does give you a, a, a cause of action. You don't have to wait for the attorney general to do something. You don't have to depend on a state statute for a right to privacy. You can establish what that right is you can establish what all of those rights are in your security agreement. It's exactly like a mortgage. It's the same thing. All you're doing is becoming, well, for lack of a better way to say it, the mortgage lender for the use of your biometric and biographical data. All right. So I just want to mention for those of you who are working on it, we're going back and forth on the, um, on the security agreement. Be sure that you, um, the the a state is not associated with a reference to the UCC. So I think towards the bottom of the agreement, there's a reference to Texas and a reference to Florida. So you can actually delete those. Just make sure those are gone. There is no, we don't care about Florida UCC or Texas UCC. It's just the UCC. There, it's all the same anyways. All right, so there's that. I'm not going to go into too far on that, but there's one thing. Um, <clears throat> one thing that's really... Uh, just lately come up and I, I I caught a hold of this by looking at some videos and I, I discovered that there's this entire group of, let's call it demographic or whatever, group of people that are younger people that are considering like we would maybe uh, as we get older, you know, we, we decide to get married and have a family and these sorts of things. And again, it's all about property rights. That's why I look at this. And so the younger people now are looking at a situation where they don't want to get married. The men don't want to get married because the court system, the rules of procedure, and the state statutes are very unfriendly towards men, to put it politely. And um, it's just the way it is. So they're thinking that the solution is don't get married. Well, that's destroying the family. It's destroying the, the population uh, rate, things of this nature, which is, I believe, the agenda. So the reason why they're not getting married, they think this actually doesn't solve their problem. They think that um, a marriage, a relationship, allows the one of the other spouses, it's usually going to be the woman, 78% of the time it's the woman, to come in and, and pillage the marital community, to take the property, to create uh, lifetime payments, alimony, child support, and maybe even take custody of the children and be unfair and all these things. For the most part, I believe that's what's happening. I think we all know we've heard some sort of news about that. But my thinking is the state's doing this. It's an agenda. So what do you how do you deal with that? My think it is let's divorce the state. Right. Let's let's get the state. Let's preclude the state from interfering in this arrangement, because look at it this way. A marriage is a private membership association. It already exists. The state is intruding on that relationship because you don't know any better, not because you have a license. That really doesn't matter. Um, the license itself does not create the problem. You can have a marriage license or not. OK, that doesn't alone give the state or take away the state's uh, authority or whatever. Um, and so the husband and wife is a private membership association. Then if they have children, you have the husband and wife and the children, that is a different private membership association. So there's, you know, there's different things going on here. What we want to do is use the private membership association that exists and retain the authorities, the rights, the, the private property rights within that organization and not give it up to the state or the, or the court because it's demonstrated that it's part of the abuse. It's part of the destruction of our family system. And so the way you do that is, um, and I'm going to go over the points real quick here. Let me let me see if I can do a screen share because I have it written down so I, I won't forget. Uh, let's do a different screen share. 
new share. And uh, uh, here we go. So I summarized it. All right, guys. Let's see. Okay. So I summarized it, as you can see in the screen sharing. So this is <clears throat> what I've done. So I create this situation where um, we have a prenuptial, uh, prenup it can be used as prenuptial or postnuptial, but we're using the Federal Arbitration Act and it's going to preclude the family court from taking jurisdiction yeah. in the marriage. So if there's a dispute or there's going to be possibly separation or there's a dispute over child custody, things of this nature, this agreement divests the state court of getting involved. Now, this does not, uh, this does not happen or it's not true. It doesn't apply if there's neglect or abuse anywhere. But that has to be established by evidence. And that's another thing that this agreement does is it, it makes the court slow down. It, it gets rid of the court, really. And if there's going to be any court involvement, that is precluded by this agreement unless there is at some point an evidentiary hearing involving abuse or neglect. So that that, that throws a monkey wrench into their scheme of getting in that situation and maybe even taking custody of the children. This is another reason. I mean, you divorce the state in the situation and you prevent ch child trafficking, all right? You prevent unfair, you know, unfair uh, agreements, divorce decrees, things of that nature. You, pr you prevent or mitigate, reduce the destruction of that family, that wealth basis. So this also can be used to preclude the court from imposing contempt of powers over any of the parties, which it could work both ways. I mean, you, it just, really what, it's, what this is doing is putting the power back in the family and we just have to act accordingly. So you could mess this up if you're not acting accordingly, but it's pretty strong the way this works so that a person cannot be vindictive. One of the spouses be vindictive and, and break this agreement and then get the court involved and then go back to the same abuse situation. That's not going to happen. This court would preclude this, this agreement would preclude that. Um, but I'm just saying it puts the uh, responsibility back on the on the uh, parents and the husband and wife. So in the agreement, one of the standards that's applied is the way in which the family is operating today and up till today before this dispute came in uh, is going to be the standard by which the family will continue to operate. It's still going to be a family, but maybe there's going to be a divorce, let's say, then that those standards would still be applied. So let me give an example. So let's say there's a, 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 an, a an agreement for child support. We, we arrive at child support. Well, that should be consistent with custody, right? Why should a parent pay child support and then not have custody? Why not just have custody and then reduce the need for child support or eliminate it, right? So there's some things, there's some fairness that goes into this. <clears throat> but basically what we're doing is all the effort the legislature has taken since probably the 80s, 90s, and all the rules of procedure that have divested the court itself. I mean, they've actually been doing this. The legislature has been taking away the court's discretion <clears throat> and telling the court what it can and cannot do. And that's why we have this abuse situation because your legislature is actually creating this for you. So we need to take this back and this is how you do it. You set up arbitration, you have a completely different set of rules uh, and it's, it's a lot more favorable, I think, if you're gonna be diligent and be a parent or a husband or wife. So um, we're going to protect the children. Uh, we still have we still have uh, the the court involvement when there's abuse and neglect. So that's not out the window. But uh, what I what I also did in this uh, postnuptial agreement, uh, and I and I use the term postnuptial loosely because it can be prenuptial. It's just an agreement. Okay, it's an agreement that has to do with a marriage. All right. So in the formation of this agreement. Uh, a trust is declared that takes ownership of all the chattels in the household. So you get rid of the furniture and the appliances and electronics and all these chattels, all these things that benefit your life every day, all the fixtures on the wall, silly stuff like that, right? We make those owned by a trust. Don't move them anywhere. We just make the declaration in this agreement. So what that does is it, it guts the marital property. It removes the marital property so it cannot be dissipated or removed Otherwise, and, and it settles the matter. It settles the manner in which the property will be continued to be used or benefited, right? The trust already does it. It's a settlement agreement, okay? 
So the trust is the settlement agreement inside the postnuptial agreement. This divests, even if the court were to take jurisdiction, it divests the court of doing saying anything about the chattels in the household because that's already been settled. Again, we beat the court to it. Not that the court would be able to in, intervene, but just I'm just saying that would that trust is kind of a backup to do this. What's really uh, what's really going to uh, work here is the fact that the agreement includes an arbitration provision and it's binding. That means you can't do anything without going through arbitration. Now, arbitration, now I can do it several ways. If you guys want me to do this for you, I can I can do it many different ways. But we can make arbitration the award or the determination by the arbitrator, we can make that subject to an appeal too. We don't have to just forego appeals. We can all we can have an appeals process, which is also part of the arbitration process. So we have every remedy and every thing that's needed to, to resolve disputes already without the court system and without attorneys. I mean, some of, some of them are the problem. They just want billable hours, right? Um, so anyways, I don't want to go into too, too much of this. I just wanted to say this is, you know, something that I've been working on and, um, and I'm, I'm making some comments here about the bar. So I'm just going to scroll through this because I know this is recorded. So you'll be able to, to, to go back and pause this video and, and see what I've got here. So anyways, just want to talk about that briefly and then let's stop share on that one. And then, so now we're going to, I want to get into um, this HOA covenant. So many of you like the idea of the HOA covenant and it's going to be quite effective. You'll see it's going to be very difficult to challenge this. I do not see any legal provision where it can be challenged in the, any way that we're going to use it. So if I use an HOA covenant deed restrictions on a piece of real estate or a neighborhood, it'll work either way. I can put it on one parcel. I can put it on a whole neighborhood. I can put it on 10 parcels. I could put it on non-contiguous property. I, I, I don't see why you'd need to do that. <clears throat> but contiguous property is preferred. Neighborhoods are preferred. You could modify one. If, you already, if your home is already within an HOA covenant, you can modify it and use it for what I'm describing here. And if you need help with that, let me know. Sometimes it's difficult to work with neighbors if you can't see eye to eye, and it's hard to explain these concepts to people that have never heard any of this stuff before, and they don't they don't perceive the need to do something like this, right? But what I'm what I'm proposing, and I'm going to show you something new here, but the HOA covenant, I'm I'm using it so that you would give yourself the ability to control what the use of that property. This is where we're having a big problem in our societies because we don't really have the use of our property, as you can tell. We're getting annihilated. We're getting annihilated in economically with the property taxes, with the insurance rates, uh, and, and so forth and so on. Well, when I show you this, think about this. You will have complete control, no matter what the banks do, or the insurance, or the regulatory agencies, your city, county, township, whatever, your state, property taxes. You get the final word in all this because you ultimately control uh, the property and the use of the property, the use of the land, okay, and your house with this covenant. Now, um, if you can't work it out with your neighbors, or if it's not that, you know, maybe your neighborhood's so big, and you, maybe let's say you already have an HOA, and it's it's too much trouble. You, you're not going to get through the quagmire of neighbors. You're not going to educate them. You're going to look like a freak if you try to talk to them about this. I got something else you can do. Um, if you don't have an HOA, that makes it much easier. We can write up one and record it, and and we can show you how to use it. I can I can work with you and and show you the different ins and outs. We can also do a risk assessment and find out what may be going on in your situation that you would use it and how you would use it. So one of the technical things of an HOA covenant is that there's an HOA, right? So the HOA should be something that the state recognizes. The way that works is you would register a corporation with the state. This is what I did. I register a nonprofit corporation. It's nonprofit because when I checked the box as to what type of company, I just said nonprofit. Okay. So mine would be an Inc, an INC incorporated organization. And then that would be the HOA, um, name of the HOA, put it that way. It does not need a tax number and it does not need a bank account. It just needs to be the board, let's call it. Okay. And that's how it goes from there. Uh, in many cases, you wouldn't even need to be involved with the court. Now, if you were to be involved with the court, like if you wanted to foreclose the, the HOA's interest, you could easily do it and it would be very easy for an attorney to do it. And the attorney wouldn't have to agree with anything we're talking about. It would just be a very simple case, just like any other. So nothing, nothing unusual there. That's what I try to do is make everything normal so we don't have to educate other people in order to get a remedy. And I think we can do that. Um, and yeah, th this will apply. The HOA covenant does apply to commercial and residential. Um, did I do an, Did I do a screen share here? Let me see. I wanted to show you as I'm going through here.
Yeah. So it's got something to follow. So this is what I'm talking about right here, right? Now, <clears throat> the thing I wanna introduce, you can do this individually. This is called easements. We already have easements. We use them all the time. When you drive to work, that's you're using an easement, a public right of way. Easements can be established by a written instrument that's recorded, but they can also be established by long-term use of something. And they can also be established a couple other ways, but necessity being one. Um, easements are established all the time. They don't have to be in writing, but what I'm talking about is a private easement that's in writing that allows you certain use of the property, no matter who the title holder is. So that's code for saying, even in the event of foreclosure, the easement rights still stand. Just like in the event of foreclosure, the covenant has not been exhausted. Exhausted. So what the heck will we do with easement rights? So let me give you a hypothetical example. Let's say, uh, as long as I have the title or whoever has the title does this, okay? Because once you have the title, you can do this. After that, you cannot do it. You cannot do this when you don't have the title. Your name is not on the title. If you control the party that's names on the title, like if it's your LLC, you can do it. In order for an easement to be a valid easement, an easement, the summary of it is that it's the right of use for land. It's the right to use land in a certain way. Um, the easement only exists when there's two parties to it. You cannot have the title holder of the property give an easement to himself. Then there's no easement. And if there was an easement before then, if both parties become the same for some reason, then the easement dissolves. Just keep that in mind. So here's a hypothetical example. I go and, and buy a house in the suburbs and <clears throat> they get a mortgage on it. And then I stop paying the mortgage. And before I do that, or before the foreclosure takes place, while my name's still on the title, I record an easement on the property. And the easement says that the owner, whoever at that time, which it would be me at that time, gives the right to, and let's just say it's an organization. Let's just say it's my brother. It doesn't matter because at some point I will be able to use the property under those easement rights because of the way the easement is held. That's what I want to do. But I cannot make the easement for myself. I cannot be the, the easement right holder. So if the easements are given and there's a foreclosure, the easement is recorded in this in this example. It has to be recorded, should be recorded. Um, when the property is sold at a foreclosure auction, somebody might buy it, whatever. Somebody might try to move in. The thing is, with my easement rights, if it says in the easement rights that I can use the property just like anyone else would, and or like I can use it in the same manner in which I've been using it. In other words, I drive my car in the driveway, I go in the front door, I watch TV, make a sandwich in the kitchen and go to bed, get up in the morning, take a shower, do the same thing. Then I sit out back and I, you know, feed the dog, whatever. I'm using the house. Okay. If I say that in the easement, then I can just use the house like everyone else. I can still do that. So if there's a foreclosure and someone else takes the title, I'm really sorry for him, but I'm not going anywhere. And I really don't care what he does, but I have the easement rights. We control the use of the property. So if you don't, can't work with, or don't, are not able to use the HOA type idea, the easements would work just as well. And it's an either or situation. Now, let me give you a little bit of terminology. Okay, so let's go back to the HOA just briefly. The, the method I'm, I'm suggesting for HOA covenants is that you use a special assessment upon the conveyance of the title so that you would be able to regain control of the title. It would give the HOA a uh, right of foreclosure and or it would also compensate the HOA or the previous homeowner with a special assessment. And that has to be arranged in the, uh, the, the covenant. And then you impose use restrictions and that defeat all outside claims. So that's what I look for when I'm writing these up. I've only done a couple so far, but <clears throat> that's what I'm doing. Um, the other thing on, is on the easement rights, this new idea that I just introduced to you guys. Now, I know you know what an easement is. I'm just showing you that we can do this for purposes that will actually serve our interests. So a lot of you may be complaining and uh, complaining about what you're seeing, right? All this craziness. And maybe you think voting is the solution. I think many of you already know that that's probably not the solution. But I think what may be is taking back property rights. And this may be a very effective way to do it without using the court system and without even guessing. Because when you have these property rights, there is no way around it. 
I can even tell you that when I was in the foreclosure uh, area uh, back in 2012 or whatever, 2013, 14, uh, those, those, a lot of those mortgages were total fraud and the court upheld them all. So it, it's, a, it's a statute staple. The court will uphold these. Not that we have to use the court. So easement rights, they establish a perpetual lien just like the HOA covenant. And there's at least two parties. <clears throat> There's the dominant estate, which is the owner, the title holder, the grantor, okay? The grantor is the one who owns the property. So you bought the house, you got a mortgage on it, whatever. And you're the grantor if you're going to grant easement rights to someone else. It has to be someone else. Otherwise, there's no easement. Um, and then the person you're granting the rights to, the person could be an individual. It could be your brother. It could be your mom. It could be a group of people. Uh, you just have to describe it. It's very simple. It could be another corporation. It could be an LLC. It could be a trust. I know you'll ask me that. And so that party is the grantee of the easement rights, which is known as the servient estate, the servient estate. And I, and I think with this understanding and if we, if we start using it and identifying situations and apply these easements and record them, I mean, you can do an easement that's two pages long, okay? Uh, it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, we're not going to get beat up so much. Maybe we can then decide what's going to be done with our property tax dollars, right? Maybe we can decide that uh, the, the city codes aren't consistent with our interests or aren't consistent with our neighbor's interests and preferences. We could then start working with our neighbors and not have to be suffer through intrusion from outside interests. Okay, that's what I'm thinking. So what do you guys think about easements? Cool. I got a question. Yeah, Christian has a good one, but go ahead. Go ahead. I'll answer um, the next. Okay. Yeah. So I, I remember you talking about easement rights um, probably about a month ago or whatever. And you were saying those easement rights go all the way into airspace above your house. Is there any way we could say... Um, we could we could seize back those easement rights and tell okay. them no more chemtrails over our household. Yeah, that would be that would be a good use of the easement. Yeah, and you're right. I I, I believe you can do that. Uh, we can we can we can ret restrict the um, land use. Yeah, air is land, so we would have to. I don't know what. I mean, how would you do that? You'd have to do it on a large enough scale to impede the military. And I, I suppose you could, because right now they have an easement right. They've been using it, and we haven't said anything. And it's not international. It is over our land. So I, I, I would agree with you. I think that we can do that. That's a heck of a project, though. But yeah, <clears throat> easement rights. I mean, genocide, does that give you an easement right? Um, someone's asking me, will an easement uh, work with a commercial bank? Okay, wait a minute. If the property is sold, however, it could be sold at auction or whatever. If the, when the property changes title, can the new title owner remove the easement? It could be dissolved. Um, I think you can write it so that it cannot be dissolved. Um, no, actually, I take that back because here, here's why. The answer to your question is no, uh, but not without the consent of the servient estate. Both parties, you can't just unilaterally remove easement rights. Once you once you establish the easement rights, in order to remove them, if the new dominant estate, whoever takes the title after you through whatever means, sale or foreclosure, he wants to remove those easement rights, he has to make a deal with the servient estate, whoever has those easement rights. Who has them? You, your family, your trust, whatever. Do you think they're going to give that up? You still have control. Your control went from the dominant estate to the servient estate. You still have the same use and benefit of the property as the dominant estate. Now they're the chump on the hook with all the property taxes and everything else, all the liability. You don't have any liability. <laughs> so easement work with commercial. Yes. Commercial, residential, agricultural, horticultural, industrial. Yes. Easement rights. John? Hi, Jay. I was wondering, would um, uh, would the HOA covenant would would it be like a double 
protection to have them institute an easement? Yeah, I would. I would I would do an HOA covenant and then add an easement in there. They're, they're, they can be used together or not. And if but you they, have, like, uh, I've already put the property, we did a quick claim, put the property in a trust. And we made the LLC the, not the beneficiary, but the trustee. So good. the trustee of the LLC create an HOA covenant and then in that covenant create an easement. To just do okay. Action? Would that be For the HOA better? covenant, I, I wouldn't make the HOA the owner of my property. I would separate them out. I would make the HOA corporation a nonprofit corporation registered with your state. Totally separate entity. Okay. okay. And, and so there's that for the covenant. And then on easements, just make sure that the serving estate is another party. So if your LLC or trust owns your property, you can make each and every member of your family individually the servient estate. Yeah. The or LLC is the, the trustee of, of yeah. the trust. Well, the trust is the title holder. So literally whatever the title holder is, how it's described in your quick claim deed is the, is the one who can issue the easement rights. Okay. So that would be the trust. Yep. The exact name on that. Yes. And then you make the, the us as, as the, the, the residents of the property. The, you, the you would make yourselves the, the beneficial and the beneficial uh, party of the uh, easements. Right. Or uh, if you're talking about the HOA covenant, then you don't really have that situation going on where there's another party. So you have an HOA covenant that can control the title of the property, and then it would do so it, for the benefit of, of yourself, whatever you originally intended. If it's a, an easement, then yeah, you're going to have the two different parties. So the easement is going to be the title holder and then another party. So it could be like your trust is the title holder. And then the, the list of your family members can be the serving estate, different ones. But you can also just give that group a name. The Smith family. That, that's the serving estate. You could do it that way too. And then in the articles, you, really don't need both, then you're saying do you don't. Video. You don't need both. They're both as equally effective. One might apply a little bit better uh, than the other. Like if you say to me, my HOA, uh, my HOA, I already have an HOA. Uh, my neighbors think I'm crazy, uh, but I still want the protections. Very simple. Do an easement. Do an easement on your parcel. Okay. Do you recommend one over the others with your research so far? I you... would uh, based on each person's in unique situation, but right now I'm just telling you generally they're about the same. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Jacob. Hey, John, do you have to own the title um, outright uh, in order to create easements or uh, be able to do the contract none at all it doesn't matter doesn't matter at all it doesn't so matter I, what lien as long as you have the right to sell the property then you can do it okay so if the bank owns the property then i don't have the right to sell it but if i yeah. own the property then i right. can sell it if the bank took it back in a foreclosure once it took the title following a foreclosure you lost your right to do the easement so during a foreclosure you can record an easement just do it before I, they change yeah. the title of of course, got it. Um, but if I own it outright, the property Either, it outright, doesn't it then doesn't matter. It won't. It won't matter. So, so my question is: is I've been um, I've been following some Steve Emerson, mm -hmm. and I've been looking into how to negotiate with the county mm -hmm. through basically challenging the ad valorem nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and so that's a pretty lengthy process, and um, it's really uh, yeah like intensive and, in, and in learning and learning the law, basically you have to be able to, uh, become a purse, uh, a safe, uh, what is it? It's a, I forget what the title is, but you know, it's you, you defend yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Without an attorney, right. Without a lawyer, it's per se yeah. or something. Is, is this just a short book? Yeah. Yeah. Is this, this allows you to cut pro se? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. This, this gets rid of all the arguing, educating, because it's one thing to know the law. Steve does. He understands it very well. And he, I think he understands judicial procedure by now. I've listened to him quite a bit. And, and that's another uh, stumbling block is not understanding judicial procedure. It's one thing to understand the law, but then how do you affect your rights under the law? Most people don't understand. They don't know the little nuances that, that are needed. 
So you're really in a in a, a difficult situation there. And so what what's your cause of action, right? If the if the state or the county wants to still impose property taxes, the ad valorem tax on your property, what's your cause of action? Well, I mean, the cause of action would you'd have to go back into the case law and show that they actually don't have any standing whatsoever to charge your personal okay. property. Okay, but what is your cause of action? Is it breach of contract? Is no, it, the cause the the cause of action would be literally um, they have no right. They're violating your your private property rights. Right. That's not a cause. Of, that's yeah, but that's not a cause of action. You have to state a cause of action. You have to be. You have to give the court something that it has jurisdiction over. Just saying that I have private property rights is not enough. You you have to articulate something. Like for example, um, you want to sue. Oh, I get it. Yeah, you want it. to sue for injunctive relief, and the junction has to meet the criteria, or you want to sue because you overpaid your taxes, right? So you would pay and then sue for the refund. So the cause of action would be, um, uh, it would be U.S. Title 41-1983 Act. It could be, but that's not a cause of action for what we're talking about. Property taxes, no. I mean, Stephen likes to do that. I don't agree with him on that. Uh, that's huh. just such a cliche. That's people don't understand what they're doing. You need a cause of action against your state property appraiser or property assessor, state property tax assessor. What is the cause of action? I overpaid. And how do you get jurisdiction against the state? You got to exhaust your administrative remedy. You've got to probably end up paying the tax and then sue for a refund for overpayment. Mm -hmm. That's your cause of action. I don't, right. I don't know. I mean, there's probably several others, but it's not going to be a civil rights action. <laughs> no. Could, could they use color of office? Couldn't you do that? Because in Georgia, the color office is a no. cause of action listed in statutes. Well, there is a cause of action for that, but you're going to ask the court for something like injunctive relief, or you're going to ask it for comp compensatory damages for overpaying taxes. That's two things you're going to ask for. I mean, th you want the, the state tax authority to do its job, and it's doing its job. It just misclassified your property as subject to the tax. I'm sorry. Yeah, don't, don't, don't say that the office – I mean, they're acting outside the office. Okay, fine. I mean, I don't know what your remedy, you're, you're going to look at uh, injunctive relief there, but I think to get jurisdiction past sovereign immunity, you're going to have to figure out what that is. Now, these guys are very clever. They stripped us of all the judicial procedure. Like, for example, okay, so they say, here's the tax bill, pay it. There's no finding, there's no, they say there's an assessment, but it's not. And, and there's no judicial review prescribed in the statute for the most part. So we kind of have to make it up. It's wild, wild west. And how are you going to find somebody to help you do that? And how are you going to figure out yourself? This is what I'm talking about. You have to go to the court and you have to invent a cause of action. You have to give the court some way to get involved. They made it really hard for us to do that. So yeah, the answer to your question is the easement rights and the HOA covenant, problem solved. You can say, I will taxes all you want. I will ignore you. Got it. And so if they, for instance... You know, they're not educated on the. Hmm? They're not educated on what? The they're not educated on doing contract law. Um, and sorry, the, you know, they're not they're not educated on on probably like the power of contracting through an HOA. So then they send stay, you know, the sheriff to come out and evict you would you end up having to sue them then at that point? No, or... no, no. Let's say they, uh, they, they wouldn't even get to that point. They would get to the point of selling your house for not paying property taxes. Let's just play this out. So the foreclosure takes place. Your they house is it. sold at auction and the HOA simply waits. Nobody yep. does anything. The new property holder comes in. Let's say that, let's say somebody wants to move in, right? Maybe they're, maybe you didn't move out. Maybe you're still in the house. So they'd have to try to take possession, right? So let's say they did that. Let's say they got an order from a court to take possession and you're still there. Mm -hmm. Well, the HOA can then step in. Now the easement right would be easier here, but the HOA could have, before that happens, it would have time to foreclose on the property and strip the new owner of his title and do whatever it wants. And so you way, do basically do that through the, through the state courts? Yeah, what you would do is, uh, my estimation is you would need an attorney to do it. The attorney wouldn't even have to have this conversation. He would just, you would just, the HOA would go to the attorney and say, look, here's, here's $3,000. Go ahead and foreclose on this house because whatever criteria are met. There's some notices and things that have to be sent out. But basically, you give, the HOA gives each owner or gives itself 
the ability to foreclose whenever it wants. That's what I'm, that's why I'm doing. I'm modifying the HOA so that you can do that. That's why you got to have everybody on board. And you're, and you're having to do, well, I mean, it's, it's my property is 20. Right. So there, there's no HOA because <laughs> you have to get an attorney because you've, you've incorporated, you've yeah, incorporated and you've made, you've, yeah. you've made basically the, the owner of the property a taxpayer by incorporating with the state. You got You got to get that out of your brain. <laughs> that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Forget the incorporating okay. and all changing your status. And that doesn't matter what we're talking about here. Look, just because I'm using a lawnmower to cut my grass does not mean I'm a lawnmower. If I'm using a corporation for a purpose, it doesn't make me a corporation. And I don't care about the tax situation because I registered the company so I can get a certain benefit and I'm going to get that benefit. There are no other de detriments to it. I don't have to file tax returns for it. I'm going to use it to be the HOA. Who cares if someone says it's a taxpayer? It doesn't matter. I'm just controlling title to real estate. Yeah. This is this is from the 90s and the 80s, probably from tax protesters are talking about. They're all scared of using corporations. Even my own partner was when we first started. It was the worst thing ever to register your corporation. I've never found better success than I when I started doing that in the 90s. I've been so effective with that, Re using corporations, using EINs. My clients don't pay taxes. They don't file tax returns and they do it legally. So, but this, what we're talking about here is an HOA to recover the title may have to sue and you have to have an attorney, which is great. That, he handles all the ugly work. You just say, look, do this thing. We, here's, we met all the notice requirements or if we didn't fix it for us, <laughs> go take the title back and then you guys can do what you want afterwards. Got I it. like the easement rights, but yeah, you can use the HOA. And yeah, what you're asking uh, dep deprivation of rights. Yeah, okay, so someone's asking about deprivation of rights. I don't know. Okay, depri what rights? I mean, you, you have rights, but you have other remedies. I, I wouldn't say do a civil action. E EK is asking whose rights. I don't know. But Ray, what do you think? You want to weigh in? Oh, I just wanted to ask you. I, I kind of got sidetracked for a minute, but can can uh, can I do the HOA and? Uh, uh... I was I was going to have you do that. I'm going to do that for okay, mine. Okay. I'll do it for yours. Yours too. Easement rights. Okay, because yeah. that's like double power. I mean, instead of I love it. pistol carry two. Exactly. Yeah. So right, Ray right. and I are kind of doing the same thing together on each of our properties. So. <laughs> 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 yeah. I so I had a, a letter. I sent a letter off to my uh, county tax appraiser. You know, and that was nice to the guy. I'm sure. He just got the job. It was vacant for a year. He just got the job. I'm sure he doesn't want a nasty letter from me. I'm right down the street from him. It's a small town. I'm not joking. You can drive the speed limit at 60 miles an hour and pass through the town in, in 90 seconds. Unincorporated? Town. Yes. Yeah, yes. okay. So it's yeah, yeah. you're in the country. Okay. Yes. And if I, if I want to get anywhere, I was just there the other day. If I want to get anywhere, I can go 16 miles in either direction and just barely get to society just barely get to like food distribution or something. <laughs> I mean, it's way out there in the woods. So he, he just became the tax assessor. He doesn't know anything. And, and he, know anything. he knows is what they yeah. told him. I mean, yeah. I went to meetings before and I was talking about oath of office and bonds. And I finally had a retired county commissioner come to me and he said, what are you talking about? Yeah. And he didn't know. He said, oh, I remember signing that. They never explain anything. They don't. You're just a, you're That's just a. a yeah, you're just a, a, a form jockey or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. a tool. So so I, I would just apply to him and I just said, hey, this is private property. I live here and um, I'm not using it for commercial purposes, but if I do, I'll let you know. So please remove it from the tax rolls. And I thought he did because I looked at the a parcel. There's two parcels and it, it wasn't removed. I thought, he, but anyways, so he, he I got a bill, a proposed bill or something. And I was like, ah, crap, I, I'll just wait a month. And then I I sent him a letter and I said, hey, you know, this is the follow-up. I just want to let you know, you should probably take the property off the tax rolls. The administra administrative code explains how to do it. And I cited a couple of things. I said, but if, if it's, you know, not, if it's a problem, don't worry about it. I have other remedies. <laughs> and I left it at that. <laughs> you know? He and doesn't I, know that. Yeah. I don't need to harass the guy. I mean, whenever I drive to my property, I pass his office. He's <laughs> Like we're neighbors. I'm not going to, you know, he pro I'll probably see him sitting next to me at the restaurant or something. They have the seafood place. At right, right. Yeah, so I'm not going to harass the guy. But yeah, that's your attitude should be, look, I'm the boss. I'm the boss because I'm liable. And yeah, I'm going to follow the rules and I'm not going to cheat my neighbor and this sort of thing. But I'm not going to pay taxes uh, and let you do this 
with my money. And, and that's why I'm showing you this. It's not about not paying the tax because we do need to have things running. Look at it this way. If I say I'm not going to pay the property tax anymore and they can't do anything about it, what happens? So the, the, the appraiser is going to say, well, look, we have a diminishing tax base here. People are figuring this out. We're going to have to collect our taxes to run the county. Either we're going to stop certain services or we're going to have to collect more taxes from these other payers. Okay. And here's what's going to happen. So likely it's going to be the retailers, right? The same retailers that I have business with. So when I go there, I'm going to pay 15% sales tax or 10 or whatever. Right now it's seven or six. Okay. That's how it works out. Yeah. Or they and could everybody... say that uh, the police won't come when you call them or the fire department. You know, they could try that. Maybe. I doubt it though. However, this, this, this brings up the other issue, which is I suggested a long time ago when I started talking about this in 2020, I was suggesting that instead of just not paying them the money, take part of that money because it should be allocated. I mean, even though you're not a taxpayer to get this thing rolling, it is our community. Let's take part of that money and put it into a literal trust fund with a bank account and let's have people contribute their tax dollars and let's, let's account for that and let's allocate that money and send it to the sheriff's office and send it for uh, emergency services, right? The fire department and road maintenance and these sorts of things. Make sure that money is earmarked for those things and let them know that that's what we're doing with it. Let's be responsible, not just, you know, it's now party money all, right. all of a sudden. I don't think so. It needs to go to where it would have been, it would have gone anyways, because like my, my example is, if you're not going to pay as a property tax, you are going to pay. You're just not going to pay it as a property tax because your property is private. But that money needs to get collected because of the budget of the county or the city or whatever. Okay, fine. But ultimately, it's going to write itself. We just have to do something like this. All right, so let's, yeah, 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 because yeah, you'll be paying the share for the fire department and the escrow like that, unencumbered from socialist agenda. Yeah, yeah. it's a yeah. You, in fact, you would you would be kind of like Walmart at some point because I mean our HOAs should be used for collective bargaining with retailers and suppliers, really suppliers, wholesale suppliers. We should use our HOAs for that, but we could also use our HOAs to um, audit emergency services and find out if their budgets are, are bloated. How about that? <laughs> because, yeah, because look at it this way, insurance has been subsidizing these, these services. So w whenever you have insurance subsidizing something, it costs more. I mean, look at, look at, uh, look at in subsidizing ho home purchases. No longer is it about the price of your home is not about the cost of labor for building the home you want and materials plus a premium. Nobody talks like that anymore. What they say is, well, that guy's house sold for this, so therefore my house is worth this. Okay, well, that's stupid. <laughs> that's the definition of getting us into a real bad financial situation. Let's continue to subsidize the price as it goes up. Yeah, and the, and the easements. Okay, so notifying a new buyer. Yeah, th there's a trespass issue. So uh, you can have trespass notices. You can also notify uh, the new potential buyer. And this is another thing I like because if, like, for example, let's say, so we set these liens up, like Ray and I set these up. And so on Ray's situation, let's say someone wants to buy his house at auction a couple of years from now. Um, he's going to be really discouraged when he goes on Zillow and finds out that the HOA dues are X or, you know. <laughs> It's just gonna it's just gonna probably prevent the thing from being sold at auction. The same thing with easements. If it's on public record, you, there's no duty to notify the other party. You can also have an unrecorded easement. Now this is the dangerous one, but you can have an unrecorded easement. You just have to notice the other party and you have to be able to prove that you did that. So that's why I like to record it. <laughs> Makes life easier. Yeah, there's a way to do it. You can do it in the newspaper, but the best way is, I mean, you can do it in the mail too, but the best way is just to record them. Yeah, and so, yeah, if you got a couple of questions besides the HOA, that's fine. Isn't taxing property changing a right to a privilege? Okay. Taxing property, changing a right to a privilege. Okay, well, if, if property is taxed, if it is in fact taxable, there is the exercise of a privilege over the use of the property. We all agree with that. I don't have a problem with um, businesses getting permission from my government to operate. I think they should get permission. 
but I'm not going to seek permission unless I'm going to create a risk for somebody, right? If I'm open to the public, maybe I, maybe I, I have an obligation to get permission. In other words, pay a tax on it, get a license. Um, but uh, you're not changing a, a right to a privilege. It's either you have the right or you don't, or you exercise it or you don't. That's the way I look at it. We have the right to own property. Of course we do. So it's a, it is, yes. This is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to use a tool that allows us to exercise a private property right. If you look at my notes, that's what I started out with. I don't mention private property, but that's all we're talking about here. I'm just showing you there's a tool that we can use to protect our private property interests in real estate. And we should, because that's why we're, we're seeing all this nonsense with our government. I mean, I'm just looking at a document today. One of you guys were nice enough to send me this thing where the World Health Organization is trying to make a deal with California to, 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 to you know, in their next uh, fake pandemic and so forth. They're trying to do this already. They're trying to make a deal so they can step over all your, uh, all your uh, state protections, your government, your constitution. They're trying to step over it while at the same time saying we're not going to do that. <laughs> it's so funny. It's just amazing. TJ. Yeah, um, I'm getting, uh, I, I filed one of my lawsuits in court, and now I'm at the stage where I'm supposed to be doing a meet and confer with the opposing ah. counsel. Okay. So my question to you is, I, I don't know if you have a video out on what to look for and how to negotiate with that, because there's a number of things that the judge sent us that we have to meet about the nature and basis of the, of the claims and defenses, the possibility of prompt resolution, making arrangements for complete initial disclosures, and it goes formulation. Yeah. For okay. So the meet and confer, is that to establish a, a, a schedule for the trial, a, a time period the, for everything? Well, the judge pretty much sent out, I mean, there's four pages of this, certain deadlines of what we're supposed to meet. Yeah. And I don't know, I could send those to you if you want. Well, the way to start that typically, uh, this is in U.S. District Court, right? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, many times I just ask the attorney uh, to propose a scheduling. If that's what we're tr trying to arrive at is a scheduling order. If there's a meet and confer about something else, like what is the what is the purpose of the meet and confer? Just to go over those aspects, the nature and basis of the claims and defenses, the possibility of a resolution or so. Okay. Um, All right. So here's what here's the way you started is you just contact the other side, usually by email these days, and you just ask yeah. them what's a good date and time to get together and meet and confer. Okay. And, and just start just, it that way. Okay. Are you are you working with the Zunga on a case? I'm not. Okay. What are you doing? What what kind of case is this? Uh, this is a lawsuit I have against APS. It was uh, my former boss that uh, forced me to retire. And uh, okay, with, uh, yeah, I use the AD, I use the ADA. I use regarding okay, that is a disability and a number of other things. That's so. great, man. I'm glad to see that you you took that on. Um, what rule is being cited for the meet and confer? Uh, the rule is Rule 26A1. Nice. Okay. Did you did you write up your 26A disclosure statement yet? No, I haven't. I haven't done it. Okay. I just so you, that, you, you so. just need a little guidance. Yeah, um, okay. if you would, would you schedule a time with me, um, on my calendar Okay. and I'll be happy to go over it with you and, um, we can even look at everything. Once I show you how to do it, you'll realize it's, it's a very simple process, but it's necessary. I'll yeah, show you what to do and I can give you a couple of documents to use. Okay. That's, that's great. I don't, yeah, I don't want to do anything stupid. Uh, the other question real quick is, um, I don't know if I told you or not, but I filed a, a state and federal criminal complaint against the Albuquerque public school system for their transgender nonsense. I, yep. sent it, uh, uh, I, I filed a complaint of child abuse and neglect and practicing medicine without a license, violating IDEA law. And I sent it to the sheriff and the attorney general, district attorney, and also um, the oversight committee in Congress and the Department of Education. And um, so what would you suggest that my follow-up to be to hold them well, accountable? Well, uh, I think that the, the way to, to, to frame this as uh, it, it would be a misuse of public funds and it would be negligent. And then um, you frame it out that way. Uh, you didn't 
you, the purpose of the school is not to push an ideology, right? Well, that even st states it in the New Mexico Constitution. Right. So it's a misuse of public funds. They, they are using public funds to do just that. So should I, fi should I file a lawsuit against them or should I? Your complaint is with the inspector general's office for misuse, misuse of public funds. Oh, okay. okay. Inspector general's office for that county and state because there's different IG offices. Okay. I would don't... start there. Now, I don't know if you have a private right of action under the criminal statutes. I think that's reserved to the attorney general's office. But you may have a civil cause of action, and yeah, you may end up in a lawsuit. But I would start with the inspector general's office. See if you can at least get a response, and and see if you can frame it as a one-page letter. Okay, I'll it's, do it's that. A, but yeah, I, 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 I think do. it'll be more I, effective that way. Okay, I'll do that. But I, you know, I've got a funny feeling I'm not going to get a response because I did file uh, the disaster fraud that you shared with me. With yes, I would. I would bring that in as also. A component of what they're doing. Yep. Okay, I'd already so. filed that, so I just bring that bring that up to the. What do you mean team. filed it? You you, you filed well, a case in court? It, no, no, I, I sent it to the inspector general. Uh, the okay. uh, disaster fraud information. I sent it to the inspector general, and this was months ago, and I haven't received any response. All right, so so your remedy would possibly be injunctive relief against the inspector general's office for for refusing or failing to do something like this, audit an allegation or audit an agency for allegations of a misuse of public funds. That is the job of the inspector general's office. Oh, okay. You could sue the inspector general's office for his failure to act on its duty mm. to audit or investigate allegations of misuse, a misuse of public funds. So that agency, let's say, let's say it's the school board. God, John, this is a full-time job, man. I, oh, it is. When you take on a case like this, it is going to be, yeah, a while. So, hey, I'll tell you what. I will trade you that one case for mine. <laughs> you do it. All right. No, I'm crazy. So, <laughs> so uh, this is what all I do, like all day, like type on the keyboard. So, but what, that's what you do is you use the inspector general's office, and the the language you want to use is that the agency does not have um, budget approval to use funds for this purpose and then you have to describe the purpose the, it's the violation that you just described it's it's uh, promoting an ideology and then you describe the ideology and then promoting just, the, the mutilation of children invite what? me to come over to your house for a month so I can just spend time with sure you yes stay, look over my shoulder yeah but look let's <laughs> let's do a call together because we can cover this all right and i'll give you the language and i'll, I'll help you with the procedure and i've got some documents i can share with you but yeah the thing is you want to you want to find the right person like is when i when i get a call from someone at a, at a hospital in the last couple of years where they couldn't get in because they, they wanted to make them wear the mask and all this nonsense it's not about you're not going to solve it with that front end person he or she is just following rules he's afraid he'd lose his job yeah you have to call the risk management office and you're going to talk to somebody at the hospital like a CEO or CFO and may not even be on site. It might literally be the chief counsel or risk manager. And you want to, you know, make your argument to that person and you're usually going to get a good result if you talk to the right person. So half the battle is talking to the right person. The other half is describing the thing that needs to be remedied. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I told you what happened with my wife. They denied her services. So I'm still in the middle of all that nonsense. Choose yeah. your battles carefully, because like yeah. you know, so you can battles. get bogged down. And yeah, every day we see a wrong and a wrong and a wrong and a wrong, but you got to pick your battle. I, I just had some weirdo thing the other day. And I just, instead of writing a letter, I literally wrote up a lawsuit. <laughs> a whole pleading, and I just sent it to him. And I told my wife, I said, I'm done with it. I'm not even going to do anything. I'm not going to file this. I'm just going to show it to him. Let him do what he wants to do, right? It was some bonehead that we hired to do something. Well, that's, I'm not even yeah. wasting you know, my time with that. Yeah, I know, but I think it's important to do that to confront these people. Yeah, yeah you have to. Yeah. A little bit and let I'm them glad know. you are. Yeah. yeah. That, and yeah. so, but you're right. I mean, going down that rabbit hole, it's never going to end, but uh, yeah. I'll do that. I'll talk to you about it. Thank you. Yeah, look forward to it. Okay. Hey, Ray, what do you got? Okay, I got a question back on the... Um...
divorce in the state, you know, in yeah. the post-nuptial agreement. Yeah. So if a couple wants to do this, and you say it's different with, if the couple has children as opposed to if it's just a married couple, and if they have children, it's a little bit different agreement. But how, what 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 would you charge them? I mean, I mean they, uh, they need to marriage uh, couples with marriages with children definitely need to do it because of predatory you know the uh of what's going on on the children yeah it depends on where they are in the process um i i I don't have a set price because i don't know what i have to do now if i talk to you yeah so i typically don't like to bill by the hour because it's not fair to you in my opinion so i like to just say come up with something like it's going to be around a couple thousand dollars and maybe it's going to be a small amount up front and then it's going to be the rest of it later and I'm going to give you a time limit. I'm going to say, I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to show you how to use it. And we're only going to be needing to work together for 90 days. It'll be something like that. Like okay, in your case, you. yeah, in a case where there's a federal a court, a federal proceeding going on, I already know that it's at most two years, but the most of my work is going to be in a, in a one year period. And, and right. most of that's going to involve discovery. And I already know what my hours are. I already have my strategy. So now what about, I mean, what about on uh, relationship marriages where they're not, there's no problems. I mean, they're just being proactive, being a uh, uh, prudent. I state. like those ones. Yeah. It'd be a, a simple fee, like a few hundred dollars. Okay. Cause just, you can, there's a trust yeah. involved, what you were saying. And yeah. They, and it's recording the County. Okay. Or what? Exactly. Yeah. We okay. can record it too. We, I mean, we don't need to do the trust. If you want me to do a trust, I can actually write that document up too. But if I, if I don't, I don't need to do that. We just have a declaration I'm, of trust. I'm just we thinking don't, about my daughter and yeah. I got two grandchildren. So I mean, there's no problems, but Hey, it's good know. to have one. I mean, I was even thinking of doing that with my wife, but we have a unique arrangement as you could possibly imagine, yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. I, I, you know, I I'm in a situation where what I, what I did when we first got married, I don't know why I do this, but I, I let my wife control everything as far as money goes. And she could just tell me, get out of here and I'll be like homeless, you know? So that's where, I, that's what I'm doing. Guys, no wonder don't you don't do have that. any problems. You control yeah, the yeah, well, Don't do that guys. I'm just, I have a weird situation. I like that situation <laughs> because look, I mean, my wife, she would need me to know what to do. Right. Right. So I kind of am the lean holder, right? You, you, you have will. no assets. Nobody can go after them. I have nothing. And yes. she signs for everything I and see. she sees everything first. I, if I need money, I have to ask her. So it's kind of like that. Wow. Um, yeah. But uh, this type of agreement, yeah, it, I'm going to make this using these different tools to give the family the most control. Hopefully the husband and wife or, or the girlfriend, boyfriend relationship, they, they're going to be working together to some extent. They're going to be working together. I've seen some where there's complete, you know, I can't get anything done. Yeah. If they don't get, if they're not getting along, it's not going to work. I wouldn't think. I mean, you. it, it, to- it prevents it, it it's good when they're amenable right now and it but it prevents someone from using the court to beat up on the other party right later on mm-hmm. yeah so it is gonna it's gonna be pretty tight it's gonna box you into you're not gonna be able to abuse the other person either way one party or the other so it can start a fight just by bringing it up because if one spouse says it well why won't you do it oh you know i could do it right now with my wife i can call her in right here in front of y'all and she would be like huh She's smart too. She'll, she knows, she knows me. She know, and I could explain it to her and she'd be like, okay, I'll sign it. She would, but I don't care. <laughs> right. You know, so you want to hopefully have that situation. And yeah, I think it's a good, also it's, it's, it's um, by managing your marital community, your marital state in such a way, you actually can preclude creditors from, from getting in there as well. It's kind of like what we do in corporations. If you're going to be able to divorce the state, why couldn't you defeat everything else? I mean, if, I mean, really, it gives you a lot more control. It's not something you're ever going to hear from an attorney because it is not where their bread and butter is. They make money creating controversy. Mm -hmm. Right. right. I make money by eliminating it. Yeah, I mean, I like that. You divorce the state and then you're killing jurisdiction of the court. Yeah, the jurisdiction really comes back to your Or should I say jurisdiction of the corporations impersonating court? Yeah, yeah. And so the one thing I didn't really mention in this uh, post-nuptial type of deal is that eventually, I mean, you could do this right now yourself if you if you kind of figure out how this works, but I want to have a, an, a, a software application that allows a jury to be convened of people that could make a decision on the dispute. If there is a dispute in a marriage, you could rely upon people, 20 people that are married, right? You can, you can qualify them. Or I can have a, a jury, let's call it a jury, arbitrate the dispute. I want to make that available to people in whatever situation they're in. Look at your security agreement. 
you'll see in there that um, there's an arbitration clause. And I have a little bit of instruction in there. And this is what I'm thinking. Imagine if we, if look, <laughs> you put a lien against Google, right? And yes. Google has Google has a problem with it, right? Or Google goes into default. What's its remedy? It has to go to the jury system that we create. Mm -hmm. You could call the common law jury. Yeah. yeah, this is, okay, this is where the common law jury idea fails because you're, the government attacks it all the time as like a um, an attempt to overthrow it itself. That's why the common law jury, you don't hear that so much. The jury is comprised of jurists. That's you and me. We are the law. We have limitations on what that means, but we are the jury. When you talk about the common law jury, you're almost asking permission of your overlord to, to do something other than what your overlord wants. But what, what I'm saying is, we're just going to exercise our, our um, juris authority because we can. Well, let's do it within the framework of statutes. Okay, you guys are going to say, ah, you can't do that. John, that's just, uh, you're acting like a slave. You're using the statute. Okay, come on already. Look, the statutes are the common law. What? The statute is the common law. Here, here's another one. If something is not yours, it's illegal to take it. Sometimes you call it theft, sometimes you don't. But that's a common understanding, okay? It's been like that way for thousands of years. So people have judicial power. If you call it common law jury, that's fine. I like to call it a jury that's made up on demand. It's an ad hoc jury. That's what I want to call it. And I'm going to use it under the Federal Arbitration Act. That way, the system cannot say it's not something that you can do or can, you, it's not something you can do that's not permitted by law because the ad hoc jury is an arbitration forum that's, that's administered by the Federal Arbitration Act. So that's my version of the so-called common law jury. Yeah, I mean, the, the Constitution, all this stuff, okay? The public safety doctrine, what's that? What's the, you know, you have all these doctrines that have been around for, for centuries, and that is part of our, our common law, and they've made their way into our, what's called social mores. So, yeah, it, it is very similar to the common law jury. I'm just updating it with, com, you know, common everyday terms that our, the court will recognize. Not that we need the court to recognize a common law jury, because you can, you can call it arbitration. The court recognizes arbitration. So if you, if you come in, if you come in, you, you arrive at a determination, it must be done through a, a recognized neutral party. So pretty much any party is going to be neutral unless it's not, right? So once that party comes into a, a determination between it uh, on a dispute with two or more parties and there's a de determination reached, we did give what's called right now the court, your circuit court, your state court, we did give it the monopoly on access to the police power. The way that works is if I have an arbitration determination or an award, I have to go to the court if I want to access the police power to enforce it, if I, if I need to do that. Because we don't want several organizations having the police power, that's dangerous. Now you can create a situation where there's a war. So we gotta be careful on this stuff. So we go to the court for what's called a confirmation of the arbitration award. And once it's confirmed, it becomes a judgment executable, just like any other judgment. Now, in this uh, post-nuptial agreement, I'm not going to do this in every case. It depends. Everybody's a little bit different. But you can divest the court of its contempt powers. So once I get a confirmation from the court of the award, I would then be able to go to the court to have the award enforced like a judgment. But if in the award... I've already divested the court of its ability to impose contempt on anyone. What that does is it divests the court of its ability to uh, put a man in jail because he can't afford the alimony payments. But we would have already avoided that situation anyways because we came up with a fair arrangement. But let's just say that way a person can't be – it's ridiculous to put a party to a marriage or a former marriage in jail for not paying child support or alimony when that defeats his ability to do that. So the way you make sure that the party can uphold those payments is first of all, make it a reasonable arrangement, and then also have the party use a bond or escrow or some other arrangement to make sure that alimony and child support is covered. 
We don't need the court to put people in jail. What a concept, huh? Mm -hmm. I just talked to a gentleman the other day. Um, his his wife just decided to divorce him. Her dad is helping her, helping him, or helping her, I should say. And uh, he just was run through the court system. And he just told me, he said, I had an attorney and she seemed like she was helping me, but it just didn't feel like in the end it didn't. She really just didn't do the thing I needed to be done. And I said, okay, so what's the result? He goes, well, 75% of my income goes to her. And I don't have custody of my children. Okay. <laughs> he got, got bent over. This just got me motivated, right? And that was the, I mean, I had already been working on this and I'm like, I got to write this up. This is ridiculous. I went through a divorce years ago and it put me back to square one. And when I started, yeah, I mean, when I finished, I hated my attorney, my attorney worse than my ex-spouse. Yeah. Who screwed and, me over. My yeah, because, yeah. All they care about is they, they want to beat up on the man and I'm not, yeah. nothing against women, yeah. but that, that, that's the climate today. And they want to rack up their billable hours. Mm -hmm. it, like one I was just working with, uh, we had to, in order for me to even get involved, we had to remove the attorney and it was, it, it required the court. It was so bad. This law firm wanted to, to hold on to this client. And, and, and we said, no, uh, you're fired. And yeah, you're fired. <laughs> we, to, we really mean it. <laughs> you really are fired. <laughs> and, uh, they tried it every, every way to stop it. So, uh, <laughs> They just want more billable hours. I'm sorry to say they're not yeah. very creative people. If I get more billable hours, and what they're doing is you only got 70, 168 hours in the week, right? So right. the way the attorney makes more money is by simply having a, a $15 an hour paralegal do all the work. They're selling John, somebody else's time. Can't can't you bar grieve them? You know, I mean, they have indemnity. Yeah, you can. And then oh, yeah, you can do it. Well, sure. I, if you, isn't it you bar grieve them a couple of times and they it, lose their indemnification insurance? It causes maybe. Problems? Maybe. Yeah, I wouldn't say not do that, but it's not going to help your immediate situation. No, it won't help your immediate situation. But you're right. Yeah, you could. Yeah. Jacob, what do you think? Oh, Jacob's gone. I'm Can pissed. You? I can't oh. believe 75%. Sorry, I just have been steaming. I'm driving in traffic and I'm yeah. so upset that they took 75%. Yeah. Of and that guy, kid, and he doesn't have custody of his children. Yeah, solid benefit. How can that even be fair? It's I mean, even sustainable. I mean, the guy's gonna end up in jail. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm so pissed. <laughs> well, I mean, that we should be, and we should do something about it. <laughs> so, we, yeah. we, we should rest away the control of the court and take it back ourselves because you know we are the power. So, yep, Elaine, what do you think? Did I skip you, Jacob? There, there, Elaine, did you want to unmute? Did you want to ask me something? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was talking. Oh. I didn't realize it was me. Oh, muted. okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, this is just amazing. Uh, yeah, it's terrible about that guy. Um, but uh, also, I just quickly I made an appointment with you for Tuesday to confirm about yeah. Kasich and gave you the phone number. Yeah. I don't think there's anything we need to talk about. But I did want to uh, ask your help wording the uh, uh security agreement yeah of course uh, i don't want to take up time here to do that yeah yeah no problem okay yeah all Thanks. right yeah well guys we have rights okay so it's like i was explaining in the other call where uh we go for that bike ride you know down here in orlando the cops will not they don't get involved you know if you're if people in our group are going to be you know doing dangerous things yeah the cops will probably get involved but we're very responsible for the most part we have some kids out there that do stupid things but we oh, decide critical mass, yeah critical mass yeah we decide how the yeah. traffic flows and we're, we're very judicial about it we're not trying to be obnoxious and block people we try to get out of the way uh we have yeah. rules to follow we let the cars pass and this sort of thing so but but we we are the power we just have to just exercise it um you know Hey John, this is this is Jacob. Yes, go ahead. Um, so should I just should I just set that whole like um, uh, Alfonso Fagiolo and the Steve Emerson stuff? Like, should I just set that aside and and not even? Well, it's good even... to learn. These people are smart people, and you can learn from them. They don't. Steve probably understands judicial procedure. Then um, Fagiolo, what was the name? 
Well, uh, no, I mean, they, they both understand the, um, the, like the court rules and, and they know how to do that because they're, they're filing um, their, you can follow the federal cases that they're filing in their counties against, okay. you know, against the, the, the uh, law firms that are basically doing all of this for the counties, the law firms are interfacing for the counties, and they're interfacing with property owners and, and we don't know all the legal you know, linguistic terms and stuff. So they're basically, uh, you know, I, I mean, they're basically manipulating us, right? Because we don't necessarily know the procedures of the court or how to respond. That's what I'm talking or, about. Yeah, yeah, it helps to know the procedures of the court. I mean, I, I would like to help out if I could, but it's it's good to learn what they're doing. I wouldn't just say don't don't follow. I mean, learn, but just cool. realize you're, let's get to the punchline. Let's just file the dang lien. <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah. and be, I mean, yeah. that's what I'm doing. I would love to get the county to agree with me like Stephen has done with a couple of counties here in Florida. I would love to, to make that claim. But yeah. in the meantime, I'm not waiting around. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And so that makes a lot of sense. And um, and I think it is really important to understand basically how to answer, um, you know, letters and how to interface with the whole you know, that's like the administrative aspect of the county and it's all happening through the law firms. Um, yeah. And the second thing I was going to ask you is um, when I'm creating a, a, a secondary credit number, an SCN, mm -hmm. um, do you have like a, per, like a, like a video on that and the membership site of the steps to go through, or is it, is it pretty simple? Um, I believe the, the steps are there. I believe I put that in there. I think I put that a couple of years ago. Okay, cool. Um, so I can just yeah. do a search for that. Yeah, all you, all you do, it's actually pretty, it's easier now than it used to be. When I did it back in the 90s, yeah. I, had a, I had to reverse engineer things and then I had to guess to make sure I didn't merge my file with somebody else. Today, you could just go online and get the number verified that it's still valid. Uh, you can find one that was assigned or not, but no, no one's using it. So if it's assigned to a child, it's not being used for credit. So, um, but um, it won't, it, it will be okay if it's assigned to somebody. Um, because all numbers are assigned to a taxpayer somewhere. All numbers are assigned. Right. Yeah. Right. But I think I think what you said is basically just go ahead, go ahead and apply for credit. In yeah. in it, you just make up a number and you make up a, a name and they create a a credit file and that's the credit file you run with. Yeah, I use my same legal name and I use uh, my. Um, I, here's the key thing though: you want to use a different address, residential address that you've never used before. So maybe it's yeah. going to be your long lost cousin. Call them up, say, "Hey, can I use your address?" You know that sort of thing. Uh, cool. Then, you, yeah, you apply for credit, do it a couple of times, it'll get denied. Pull your file, and make sure it's not merged with your old file. If it is, you have to fix it and that sort of thing. But after a while, it'll it'll go and I've had such an easy time over the years. Yeah. Okay, so you actually use your same name. You just use a different, yep. like yep. SSN you make up. Yep, I just use a different number and then I make sure you keep a profile. I keep a little file on my computer. I think I did one a few years ago. So that was the second one I ever used. Mm -hmm. uh, I've only created two files and I hardly ever use them anyways. I mean, my credit's well, like, I don't even care about my credit. I don't even know what it is. It's like probably 500 and something. Who cares? Right, I'm, I'm still playing that little game, so. <laughs> All right, okay. so. There was, there was a, okay. So a uh, Christian, if you have something, I'll, I'll go check the email uh, to see if it's there. Um, but Ann normally says, if you send something to Ann, like the security agreement thing, maybe, maybe she didn't forward it over to me yet. So I'll, I'll go check. Sorry, sorry for the delay there. Um, all right. So Elaine, did you want to ask something else? Yeah. Do, yeah. Uh, Jay Sterling just told us not too long ago that you can't get secondary credit numbers anymore, that they're all gone. I mean, I have a few that I bought and I never. Okay. Well, I, let's. I don't look, know if it's true. Let's but, look at it like this. Okay. How long has the numbering system been in place? No idea. 1935. Okay. How many people have been born since then? Assuming that the numbers are given to born, people that are born. Let's just say people. We have 330 million people alive right now in the States. Right. We have people around the world, probably tens of millions of people that are using SSNs issued by the United States. So there's that number. Okay. So let's just say it's 400 million people that are alive today that are using SSNs. 400 million people in the year 2023, which is 90 years after the program began. That's half of the database of numbers. 
I'm sorry. Don't you think we've exhausted the numbers by now? Yeah, I would think so. so. What does that tell you? That they're they're cycling them back. They're recycling the numbers. Oh. That was the conclusion I made back in the 90s. And I was like, well, what the heck? What is this system anyways? You don't even need an SSN to get credit. That's what I realized because they were recycling the numbers. You just have to make sure that that number is not being mixed with someone else's credit file. So I don't know that that's true. I, I, I'm going to tell you it's not true. I, I think that, and I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been getting numbers as people need them for different solutions. I don't try to sell it like that, you know, but, um, and I wrote up the procedure back in the nineties and I published it on Yahoo groups. And I think there's some pretty good services out there now that are still doing it professionally. I mean, that's all they do is they create the numbers. They do it the right way too, by the way, I've, I've looked at them. So what do, I mean, what do you think? I mean, how many, how many numbers are in the system? I have no idea. Well, how long is your number? What is it? 10 digits? Is it 10? Let's see. Three. Yeah. Oh, five. yeah. No, wait, it's nine, right? It's nine digits. Oh, nine digits, nine digits. Okay. So how many numbers are there for any one digit? How many? There are 10. Each For each of the nine digits, right? You have zero through nine, right? Right. So 10 to the ninth power if you remember your algebra from high school, oh, is please. the combination, <laughs> this is the combination of numbers available, not considering the numbers that are blocked off. So what is 10 to the ninth power? Come on, you guys. Oh, please. 10 to the ninth power. I and time's up. Like. It's a billion. It's a billion. Well, that's not very much. Well, it's three times the living population of this country. Oh, okay. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Now, let me tell you some a secret from, a, oh yeah, Alfonso, yeah. Well, you know, Alfonso, he, he, he uh, you know, the affidavit's fine, but he, he may not know procedure. I wouldn't call him an idiot, but uh, he, he's, he's really smart when it comes to the affidavits. I don't know if he knows how to use them in the procedure. Like, how do you use them in regard to summary judgment? Yeah, I don't want to get off on that, but see, here's, what, here's what the IRS does. The IRS has this data collection system and they, they collect information. I'm just going to give you a little teeny tiny part of this. So Everybody who files a tax return, the, for that, the IRS creates what's called the individual's master file, an individual master file. And there's one for a business called a business master file. And from there, there's other data appended to that record. Well, the IMF, you, you can imagine if, there's, if the SSNs are being used up and they're being reassigned, and I'm sure some people live to be 80 and 90, maybe 70 is enough to where your number could be used by somebody else if they're doing that. Or maybe after you die, the number is still assigned to your estate and it may not be probated, right? So that number's still out there. So then someone else comes along, how are they going to continue using the system, making it go and then exhaust all the numbers? At some point, they're not gonna be able to do that. Or how are they gonna avoid mixing people's identity if they're only identifying people by their SSN? They can't do it. So the IRS decided to take the nine digit number of your SSN and append, append through, a, it's called concatenation. Concatenation. It's a computer term, but basically what they do is take the first four letters of your last name and append it to your SSN. And that is the identifier for your individual master file. So here are the combinations. You got 10 to the ninth times 26 to the fourth power of combinations. Now you're looking at what thousands of billions of combinations, you see? So the IRS itself solved that problem in the very beginning with its record keeping. We don't see that because it's internal. You'll never see that unless you get your transcripts or whatever. You might see something like that. I don't even know if they let you see that anymore. So anyways, I would just say to you that Sure, the uh, the numbers are being recycled and you can go get it. There are blocks of numbers that are easier to get that are unassigned. And there's a software application. It's like, a, they change it. One is called SSN Validator or something on the internet. And you can do it that way, or you can do it the old school way, which is you you grab a number and then you simply apply for credit. And then you go apply at a bank to get an account and let them check the death index. Now you can ch probably check the death index yourself now, now these days because we have Intellius and we have, 
um, these other um, private investigative tools that PIs can use, some of which you might need a license. So if you do, then you just hire a PI to do it for you. I've never had to do that. So, uh, but yeah, that's how that works. Does that help you, Elaine? Yes. All right. Thank you. Good question. So, <laughs> come on, guys, be nice. <laughs> yeah, good. There are some sites, and I'm telling you, I looked at these some of these services, and I think they really understand what they're doing. So, whatever. I mean, I wouldn't. Me personally, I wouldn't have a problem hiring them to do to do an SCN for me. I don't need one, <laughs> but I'm saying I've looked at some of these sites, and they're pretty sharp. They have a pretty good system, and it's pretty affordable. Okay, in um back in the '90s, uh, we didn't have. We, this was before um browsers, by the way. I was using the internet when when you turn on the computer, you'd have a blinking dot in the top left corner. <laughs> That's when I was using the internet, and you have to type out this long address to get to a bulletin board, which today we call a website. So that was when the days before when I before I released this information. So I reverse engineered the Navy's protocol for creating a social security number by state, and I published it. Uh, on Yahoo groups, because I knew that people like many of you here would would run with it, and they did. And I think uh, many of these services that you find out there with the SEN, I used to call it the computer, no, I called it the um, paragraph, or the um, credit profile number, is what I used to call it. Uh, so uh, that's what I did. It was Yahoo groups. I, it probably still exists. I don't know. Some chat forum. Today, I would probably publish it on Telegram. I'm lazy. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, good. Wow. If you have, if you got several SCNs, that's uh, that's that's a bit of work sometimes because you gotta you gotta keep track of this stuff. Yeah, I don't know about social scoring. I, I'm I'm thinking that the social scoring system is going to be tied to our biometric data, which is again, I think we're trying to head that off by uh, by this uh, lean the security agreement we're setting up. So yeah, I mean, bad credit, social scoring, that's all part of the same thing. Yeah, I think these these numbers recycle. Oh, because you went ahead and answered a billion, yeah. Uh, so where can you find more about SCNs? I would go to these services that do it and, and ask about the service. I could just tell you how I do it. <clears throat> if you wanted one, I could do one in about two minutes. Um, I would just go on, I go to the Social Security Administration's website. I might have the link somewhere, I have to go dig it up. Uh, go on the Social Security Administration's website, and you'll see a page there of blocks of numbers that are available by state. Now, the reason why they're by state is because it used to be assigned by state. That's how I, when I first learned how to do it, you have three different types of components. You have the block number, area, and then the sequence number. And those were assigned by state. Like the state can only issue so many numbers under the, the first three digits. And it can only do so many groups of those. And then the area, of course, the, I think the two digits in the middle is the area number. That was based on where you were born, typically, or where you grew up or lived or something. And then after that, the four digits is a sequence number. They sign that in sequence. Okay. Um, yeah, so I would just go online and I would just pick a number from that database. Because on the database, it'll tell you um, what, I like to use the numbers from the client's a uh, place of residence when he was a uh, preteen or teen. These days it'd be preteen or where he was born. That That's always, uh, because I'm trying to make it look like every, everything else. If someone were to look, if someone cared, no one cares anymore. The banks don't care how the number was originated. Um, it did help me to understand that though over, over time. But anyways. Um, do you have to do that um, for um, a, the state that you're in or can you pick another state? Yeah, you can pick any state. You okay. can pick any state. Like I, the first one I picked was in New York, right? And mm -hmm. I knew it was New York because of the number, because you can identify by the number. Mm -hmm. you, you tell me a number, I'll tell you where it was issued. Mm -hmm. You tell me your driver's license number, I could tell you all kinds of stuff about yourself, biographical data. Just by giving me the number, I could tell you how old you are. If you're a male, female, I could tell you, you know, your, I could tell you the first few letters of your last name. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. They could, they have other stuff too. Does anyways, that mean Caleb, Caleb M. Brown could figure out where you are by your social security? No, no they don't know anything about that system. They don't okay. understand it. They don't care. They're not, nobody has that knowledge except maybe the FBI. They, okay. they That's who, who would need to use it. Yeah. No one's going to care. The banks don't even care. But when I had, um, uh, I had this number that I used a long time ago. And one time I was changing my signer rights or something on a bank account. I had a business account and 
Bank of America is a big bank, right? Bank of, bank of America asked me, I was sitting in the lobby and they're doing this work for me. And I noticed the person I was working with all of a sudden became surrounded by like two or three more of their employees. And I'm like, oh, great. There's some problem with the number I gave them, you know, because it wasn't an SSN. I gave it to them as a signer on the corporation. And uh, they, they called me over and, and asked if, if that was my number to me to verify the number. And of course I had it memorized. So I told them and they said, okay, well, well, where are you born? Well, I happen to know where the number was issued and when. So I, I answered the question as if I was born in that area, which I wasn't, but I answered the question in a way that immediately they said, okay, okay, thanks. We'll fix it <laughs> because I knew how to answer the question today. I don't think anybody cares. Um, I don't know about uh, sites, but I would search for um, SSN validation type services or um, services that'll create an SCN or a CPN, computer, com uh, I'm sorry, um, credit profile number. There are still, there was some FBI commentary on the computer profile number way back. Uh, yeah, uh, do, do not use the computer profile number for anything that is a tax form or a, a license application. Don't use it for that because those require the SSN, not a credit file number. <laughs> and if you did, by the way, you're, you're not gonna break anything. <laughs> Someone will just ask you to correct yourself. Don't worry about that. All right. But you if can, you wanna, use, you can yeah. use a secondary credit number to establish a bank account. Yeah, no problem. You can open a bank with it. You, you don't have to do credit. it with your own SSN. Correct. You don't need an SSN for a bank account. But you an, do EIN, need an, an, an EIN for your yeah, LLC. The EIN should be valid. Yeah, like my children. Own. Okay, My children don't have SSN, so I had to create um, credit files for them. So they have credit and they open a bank account. Now, that makes it easier for them because if they open a bank account with a credit file number, that'll work. They have to realize, though, that if they're receiving money from a 1099 payor and that payor wants to, to validate the, the tax number, they're not going to be able to do that. It won't validate. And then the 1099 payor will withhold 30% of the money or something like that until that my children file a tax return, which they're not going to do. They don't ever have to do that. So to avoid that situation, they simply open a bank account as the signer for a corporation that has a valid EIN. And if they want that corporation to be their legal name, so be it. They can make it that way. If they want to receive a payment in their legal name, they can simply use a corporation or a corporation's DBA and that legal name and the valid EIN, and they will always be able to validate that EIN on a W-9. But they will never be able to validate the credit number that they're using as if it were an SSN for them. So there's a, there's the solution for everything. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I, um, I, I, I have a halfway effort on showing people how to build their credit and there's some really cool uh, techniques on building credit. You can add trade lines and things like that. And really quickly, like from now until the end of the year, you could have really nice credit. If you start with nothing, you could buy, you know, you have a well over 700 score uh, by the end of the year. So that's nice of you to offer that. Yeah. Well, eh. oh, I appreciate that on, on Fagiola. I don't have anything uh, to say, you know, this negative about him, but that's all right. Everybody's trying. I mean, you just want to be, you know, hopefully people are telling the truth. I, you know, you, we're all trying to help each other, but we want to tell the truth. Panna, Panna. Hi, John. Um, hey. Uh, you yeah. just gave me an idea there. So my son doesn't have a SSN and he was trying to get a job and they want to employ him. Uh, could I create an LLC and employ my son in the LLC and have them uh, pay his pay into o the... Uh, only if he can be an independent contractor for that company. They, they literally cannot do that unless he can qualify as an independent contractor. Oh, he's a minor, so he probably can't then, right? No, he, he could he could be an independent contractor. It's just that if the job function itself calls for him to do things that would constitute employment, he will not be an independent contractor. And the accounting office in the company will tell him, we have to make you an employee, a wage earner. And oh, okay. now the other truth of this is a W-4 is not oh. required to establish employment and an SSN is not required to establish employment, but they will never agree with you. They will never... 
even like when someone offers you the job and you accept the job and then they go through the um, orientation process and they go through the SSN and the forms and a person doesn't have an SSN or doesn't want to give one, they act as if the person doesn't work for them or they fire the person. And this is not a legitimate way or a legal way to do to deal with it. What they're supposed to do is every every document they need for which they need the SSN, they would simply write up a statement saying that they asked for the SSN and disclosure was refused. That's all they're required to do. There's no penalty for that. But these idiots don't know any better. These accountants, and they're all so terrified of the IRS, they will fight you and they will do what the IRS wants them to do. And there's no law that requires them to do it. So yeah, that's what, what it seems it is. Yeah, yeah. Afraid so of... I'll just tell you the end, the end result. I've never been able to win that case. I've tried it several times. I've never been able to, but I'm right every time. Of course, that's self-serving for me to say that, but <laughs> I, know I, I know I'm right, um, but I just, it's not worth the time. So be an employee and you have to get a valid SSN to do that, or they will not hire you or keep you on. Now, some, some may, it's hard to find them. The, the other way is just don't be an employee. Go be an independent contractor. Go go do something that you enjoy that's similar to that that you can get paid for. All right. I, th I, I know that's not really, you know, but my children have to do the same thing. I mean, they could do whatever they want. They can they can get an SSN if they want. I'm not going to stop them. But they they hear me all the time. They know that, you know, it's not the way to go. They would rather be an entrepreneur. In fact, they'd rather be the one that hires people. All right. And, Thank you, John. Yeah, you're welcome. Good luck with that. One thing my, my children have done, though, is, um, yeah, thanks for that link to the ssa.gov employee verify. Th thanks for sending that on the chat. If you guys want to look that up. Um, but one thing my children have done is volunteer. So for that, you can, you can volunteer. So you get work experience um, without the SSN nonsense but you're going to volunteer. So if that's what you're trying to do. Yep. You can open a bank account. You know, well, you can open a bank account for an, with an EIN. Sure. You can get an EIN. Why would you do that though? I mean, if you're going to have an EIN assigned to yourself, I don't know what benefit that is. Um, you're asking, can, can they get your driver's license without an SSN? Um, I don't know about getting your driver's license. I, I know can't. that question. I, but my my son got his driver's license without an SSN. Oh yeah, yeah, you could, yeah, you could. Yeah, you could do that. That's easy. If you don't have an SSN, like here in Florida, if you don't have one, they can't make you get one to have a driver's license. If you have one, they're gonna they're gonna tell you that they want it to be disclosed or they won't give it to you. And I don't know how to get around that. It's a state law. I mean, I think you could probably sue them under the Privacy Act. I'm not gonna waste my time with that. What I would do. Is just go to a state that's easy to get a driver's license. Every state's different. I mean, you could just get get a driver's license in any state and be done with it. Don't they do this with illegal aliens all over the place? Sure. Yeah. Getting, Why are they getting licenses? And what you know, I, I don't know yeah. if they get a social security number, and then they and they register them to vote. Uh huh. There's so that too. They yeah. do, maybe they do assign a social security number to them. Yeah. So if you have a, if you get a 1099 as a contractor, have the, t make the, make the, so you, to avoid the tax liability, uh, use, have the 1099 paid to your company. You have to use an LLC for this and get an EIN for it. And if, and when it gets a 1099, it's not going to have a, an immediate tax liability. It could, if the LLC files a tax return, that'll create a tax liability. That'll create one that didn't exist. Um, if you get a 1099, if you've ever filed a tax return and you get a 1099, uh, then the IRS will uh, expect you to file a tax return. And if you don't, you're going to have collection problems with the IRS. If you've never filed a 1040 and you get a 1099 with, with a valid EE, -E, even with an SSN, you're not going to have a tax problem with the IRS if you don't file a return, provided that you never have filed a 1040. So that what I recommend is for your children... You tell them never file a 1040, never, and you'll be fine. You'll have you'll have no problems with the IRS. It's counterintuitive. It doesn't matter if they become a millionaire without even corporations. So so crazy. Yeah. You can't rescind an SSN because it's not yours. <laughs> <clears throat> it's not your number. I mean, is it the government's number? I mean, who owns a number anyways, right? It's just like the law. Does anybody own it? 
The bar wants to own it. <laughs> People use an EIN to open a business account to pay then pay tax for it. Pay business related tax. Okay, people can do that. I mean, contractor open up. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the government um, has a number assigned to you and it's it's an account. It's an account number. Um, you can do, like for example, if you got, if somebody would do the right thing and you got a job somewhere and it's an employment, you know, wage earning type job as they classify them and you don't have an SSN, they can handle the reporting, okay? They can just, you know, the company can fulfill its um, reporting duties and <clears throat> it would still withhold. And then the money it withheld for social security would be paid to the social security administration, however they do it. And that money, because there's no SSN assigned to that payment, that money would be held in a trust account. Literally, there's a trust account for people that don't have SSNs until a claim is made on those funds. So there is a provision that the Social Security Administration uses to account for monies paid for taxes where there's no SSN on that particular payment. They already have a provision for this. I, th I thought that the collection of the uh, Social Security uh, tax just went into the general fund. That there is no, there is no trust for Social Security. That's it's not a trust fund for Social Security. I'm just saying... It's it's a it's a an account for somebody who has a name and a date of birth and no SSN. Huh. So the the name and the date of birth makes it unique, and then that money is held, let's call it in trust, for when a claim is made. So they can't do the normal thing they would normally do with the money. I don't know what that is. Spend it. <laughs> yeah, or it would disappear because it's the collection of a tax. Make it right? disappear. It would, yeah, it would disappear and they borrow it borrow it out again. Yeah. So e Eli, what do you think? Yeah, hey, so I had a, yep. uh, a question. Um, so I'm a contractor, I'm a chauffeur driver. Yep. Um, I have an LLC. So the, comp the company that I partner with, they have, uh, they send me the, the 1099 forms. They send it through my LLC, of course. It's a right. 1099. Um, as of last, because you're just telling me not to file a 1040. I recently filed a 1040 for last year. Mm -hmm. um, Is that the first one you ever filed? Yeah, because I just oh, the, the ten okay. yeah the ten forty is is like for because I'm pretty much new to the whole tax situation. Okay. I'm only twenty seven years old, so okay, um, just just trying to understand and learn um, as I go. But uh, yeah, I filed one last year. This is my first LLC that I started with. Um, so just curious about the whole process of that. Like, what would you recommend? Um, you know, I'm just new to this whole thing okay, i'm actually well, in crypto too but go ahead. from now on for the rest of your life if you get a, a 1099 in your name with your ssn or if you get a w-2 or anything like that the irs will expect a tax return and if it doesn't receive one from you within three years uh, it'll it'll begin collection procedures it'll, it, it'll do certain things first it takes a couple of years but it'll eventually end up in collections and and the irs will try to collect an amount of money it estimates that you owe for not filing. Because you filed that 1040, it's gonna expect that. So just make sure that in the future, you don't receive a 1099 or W2 or anything in your name with your SSN. Always use the LLC with its EIN. Got you. So basically if I wanted to, um, I heard that I'm able to go ahead and open up a new LLC with a, with a bank account and just not report anything yeah you just from... hold the money there did you file a okay. return for the llc also uh yeah i believe so oh wow okay uh, i would stop doing that <laughs> you can you can simply dissolve the llc and start over if you file a return for it and you want to change your accounting practice you have to dissolve the llc so all you would do is file articles of dissolution with the state and then stop filing Hold on, I'm looking at it right now with my tax forms. Uh, profit or loss from there's, business. There's a 1040 and a 1065, probably a 1065 that you would have filed for the LLC, probably. Or if it's, did you classify it as an S corp? Maybe. Did you go no, to an account? Okay. No, I have a uh, a friend who's actually like real in tune with uh, with taxes, so I just let him do it. But say he, he filed, yeah, he filed he a uh, 1040 on it. He filed 1040 for yourself. So you claim the LLC's yeah. income as your own, right? Right. Okay. 
And if the LLC, if the LLC did not file a tax return, <clears throat> like a 1065 or something, you can still receive money there and not have the LLC file a return. And you can choose to not file a 1040 because you decide how the money is being reported and no money is being reported in your name. So as long as none is being reported in your name, the IRS will not look to you for a 1040. Okay. Like, because, and the reason in your situation is because you're not getting a 1099 or a W-2. So if you get those reports and you actually receive the money, the IRS has a duty to account for that. I call it reconcile. I might be misusing the term, but that will be posted to your individual master file, or in your case, maybe the business master file. And the IRS has to reconcile. The only way it can do that is with the tax return. And that's why it'll scream for your tax return because you already filed one. So it opened an IMF for you. Once you file that return, they open an IMF for you. You can't escape that. Like me, I filed nine tax returns in my life. So basically I can, uh, this is the last question I got, but I appreciate you uh, for shedding light on this. But um, yeah, so basically, yeah, so I had the 1040. So what you're saying is basically, I don't necessarily need to file anymore, right? You don't need to, um, and just realize the, the what's going on. So as long right. as you're not gonna get a, a 1099 or, or something like K2, W2 in your name, you can okay. just not file and you'd be just like me. I, I manage a lot of money. I receive it through my companies, but I don't realize a gain, nor do I get reports. I don't use an SSN uh, for any money associated with money or my name. And so that's what you would just do. It's, it's just one little habit you would just use for the rest of your life if you want to do it that way. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Yep. Thank you, sir. All right. Sure thing. Good questions. All right, guys. I hope I hope that uh, you like the subject matter. I'm, I'm really excited about this post-nuptial agreement, the security agreement. If you guys sent one in for me to look at, I'm sorry if there's a delay, I'm getting to them as fast as I can. Um, I will get it back to you and I'm coming up with a pricing. So what I decided to do, and you can't go wrong with this, but here's what I decided to do recently is on the royalty section, I made it $9 to collect my data. And then I made it uh, $25 per year, I think it was. Yeah, $25 per year or 1% of what the debtor claims or has established the value of my data to be, whichever is greater. I believe it's going to be the 1%, but my fail safe is $25. I'm not trying to get rich on this. I'm trying to create a liability on their books when they get my data. I think $9 and 25 is going to be plenty. And I put another provision in here for uh, quarterly payments. So we could talk about that later as, as I do each of yours. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Appreciate your comments, DV. So yeah, there's that. And um, that, that post-nuptial, I mean, really, it really would be useful if everyone were to do that and, and understand what that means because the court itself, I'm gonna tell you right now, it's not a court. It is a private club. George Carlin was not joking. Although the way he said it was very funny. Uh, and you're not in it, okay? It is a private club, but your family is also a private association and the court's not in it or it wants to be. You have to go out of your way to divest the court of its ability to intrude in your own private club. And you should, because we have faculties. We have the ability to resolve disputes and we can follow the same type set of rules that are objective rules for the most part that a court would, and we can get a better result. We should be doing that. That's what the post-nuptial is intended to do. Okay. Appreciate that, Panna. All right, so, uh, and I hope the HOA covenant, let me know if you wanna work on one. Um, many cases we can do both. Uh, we can do either or. I like the covenant. Ray and I are doing one of each. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come up with some language as you guys uh, discuss it with me, so. All right, y'all. Well, Great enjoy call. your weekend. Yes. Thank you, John. You all right. Too. Thank you all for joining. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Good night, y'all. Good night. Bye. Bye.